with U.S. military bases, and we can debate if this is because it's a rural versus an urban idea, if this is because the southern bases are more, in terms of climate, um, better for what the military needs, but regardless, this is the debate that we will be discussing for the rest of the lecture series. I'll be looking at how it evolves after the American Civil War. Dr. David Silby will be looking at the issues when African Americans start to be incorporated into the idea of a Southern military tradition during the Philippine War, and our own Dr. Heather Sturr will be looking at this issue during the Vietnam War. Tonight, Dr. Lee will be launching our lecture series on the Southern way of war, taking to task one of the toughest works within this argument, possibly one of the most controversial. Dr. Wayne Lee is an Associate Professor of History and Chair of the Curriculum in Peace, War, and Defense at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is the author of numerous articles and the book, Crowds and Soldiers and Revolutionary North Carolina, which is right over there if anybody wants to take a look at it. Um, he has edited two volumes. He has two in production, one on the relationship between war and culture in world history, and the other on military alliances and the relations between early modern empires and indigenous peoples. His forthcoming monograph, Barbarians and Brothers, Atrocity and Restraint in Anglo-American Warfare, 1500 to 1865, is forthcoming with Oxford University Press, and it is poised to challenge the entire field of early American war and society. Dr. Lee specializes in early modern military history, with a particular focus on North America and the Atlantic world. He also teaches courses on violence, as well as the early English exploration of the Atlantic. He works on several archaeological projects and is currently participating in a regional project in the mountains of northern Albania. Dr. Lee's talk tonight is entitled Celtic Warriors and Confederate Soldiers, Putting the Celtic Way of War to the Sword. Right. <laughs> thank you for that introduction and thank you all for coming to hear me. Um, I, I just, you just made me change my introduction and my conclusion. Um, <laughs> why are so many Mer modern American military bases in the South? Senators are a lot of money in the Cheap land. <laughs> it's cheap real estate. There's nothing cheaper real estate outside Columbus, Georgia, uh, back when they found Fort Benning. I mean, that's not good land either. Uh, sand Hills, North Carolina, Fort Bragg. No, nothing grows in the Sand Hills, North Carolina. Now, why that makes me change my conclusion is that one of the things I want to talk about is the way in which cultural processes help determine uh, the nature of military. And, but I want to talk about cultural processes as a, as a form of social mobilization. It's how do you mobilize a society to fight? And how do those processes lead to the nature of the military that follows? And so, in fact, choices are made within American, modern American society about where do we put army bases as a result of the that's based on real estate, which is a which is a choice about cost, a choice about you know lots of different things. Politics, you're absolutely right about southern senators, um, but one of the consequences of that is that therefore you've got these built-in recruiting depots in the south, and so that you generate out of a series of choices about social mobilization a southern, a, an overwhelmingly southern, uh, at least enlisted, uh, corps for a long period of time, as a process of a, of a much earlier choice about a particular problem. Of mobilizing resources for military purposes. So you'll see how I'm going to come back to that at the end, that, and that's how I changed my introduction and conclusion. Um, this talk is, in fact, uh, a response to a persistent ac personal academic itch, and I hope that doesn't make anybody reach for creams. Um, <laughs> as, I, as I've worked on other things, I kept running into this problem or this claim of a supposed Celtic way of war, and that claim seemed to me to have very little to do with the things that I was seeing in the documents that I was working in. And so eventually I just had to figure out what was going on. Where did this claim come from and what was making it stick? Uh, because it stick in hands. Uh, now we regularly and most, for the most part unsuccessfully instruct our students, our undergraduate students, not to believe everything they see on the internet. Um, <laughs> academics, however, have only a slightly more sophisticated weakness. We believe in peer-reviewed publications. Now, in essence, this paper is in fact a story about how an idea gained traction got shot down, but then morphed and re-emerged in a new form, and a form that in fact still continues to plague uh, early modern, at least, military history. And in part it continues to plague that field because it fits into an attractive paradigm for thinking about war, and especially about thinking about war and culture. And the paradigm I mean is the way of war, and that term and the way it's used. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Now for our purposes, the Celtic way of war thesis first emerged as a part of an argument about the so-called Celtic South. 
an idea that first appeared in 1975 when Forrest MacDonald and Grady McWinnie proposed that Celtic pastoralism had a cultural and socio-economic continuity into the antebellum South. The argument depended on several key factors, and if you're an undergraduate taking notes, this is where I still need to start writing. A unitary Celtic world that was primarily pastoral, transmitted as a cultural majority influence to the southern United States, where it persisted, and that had a major corollary cultural impacts, including on warfare. And that was the basic thesis as they proposed it and then expounded it in several articles. Again, speaking of a whole Celtic South, the military was discussed by McGuinney in a separate article that came out in 1981, in which he suggested that the the military corollary to this idea is Celtic cultural continuity in warfare. And supposedly, particularly, the, re Oops, the, wrong way. the reckless charge at the center of Celtic warfare, first as demonstrated against the Romans, then by the Scots from 1500 to 1745, and then by the supposedly southern Celts in the 1860s. Now, when McWinney articulated this in the article, other than his emphasis on the reckless charge, all he really tried to demonstrate was the continuity of a stubborn resistance to rule by others. Much of the rest of his essay simply suggested there were cultural differences between the North and the South, and that those differences rested on Celtic heritage versus English heritage, and in particular, the Anglos' persistent claim to be the representatives of civility. Now, then in 1982, McWinney and Perry Jameson published a much more comprehensive claim in the book Attack and Die, Civil War Military Tactics in the Southern Heritage. Now, they attempted to prove that the Confederate armies preferred tactical offensives and used them repeatedly from 1861 to 1863 at horrendous cost. And they based this conclusion on an examination of 13 major battles, defined as major by the number of casualties they produced. They then tried to explain that that predilection arose from two causes. One, the experience of the Mexican War reinforced by the precepts of the supposedly advanced by Napoleon. And second, a near word-for-word -word repeat of McWinney's article about the Celtic origins of the Southern Way of War. Now, the critiques of that article were quick and devastating. Roland Bertoff challenged the Celtic South aspect, pointing out the methodological issues in the way Celtic was defined very expansively and smoothing over substantial differences between different parts of the so-called Celtic world. And even the way that Celtic, and what, it, what they really mean is Scots-Irish, uh, in the New World was being overcounted in the South. Not to mention that pastoralism is more of an ecological niche response than a cultural choice. Now as for Confederate tactics, the military historians who critiqued attack and die focused on the Civil War, more or less dismissed the cultural continuity argument and then turned their attention to whether or not the Confederates had, in fact, attacked disproportionately and suffered accordingly. Most decided that they had not. Hathaway and Jones, for example, examined 30 battles instead of 13 from 1861 to 63 and found that the Confederates attacked in only 13 of them and suffered roughly identical casualties to the Union in all 30 fights. So it might seem to you that the Celtic roots of a Southern Way of War thesis has already died, and you might legitimately ask, why am I still talking? <laughs> but these first critiques left aspects of the thesis unchallenged, in particular the idea that there might have been a Celtic way of war at some time in the past. Now, at this point, for the rest of this talk, I'm not, yet, I'm not again going to mention the American Civil War. So if that's why you're here, it's time to go. <laughs> this is mostly about Ireland and Scotland. And the issue, the, the, the way this morphed, and the reason it became so sticky is James Michael Hill brings up this issue again of a Celtic way of war. And he does it in two, in two works. One is, and he's expanded on it since. One was an article called The Distinctiveness of Gaelic Warfare. Note the dates, 1400 to 1750. And before that, the book Celtic Warfare, 1595 to 1763. Now in the book, which I'll focus on, he examines the last of the 16th century Irish-English wars in Ireland, which is called variously the Nine Years' War or Hugh O'Neill's Rebellion. He, the Scottish Civil War of 1644-47, Killicronkey in 1689, the Jacobite Rebellions of 1715 and 1745, and finally and wildly, the Highland Regiments in America during the French and Indian War. Now what he does is basically assume the continuity between the ancient Celts up until the 16th century. 
And he identifies the elements of that continuity as, here, why don't, here go my hands again. One, tactical offensive, quote, against all reason, against all odds, reliant on unbounded fury, strength, and dexterity that highlighted the prowess of each individual warrior. Who, second, were at their best in small mobile armies where the leader could lead by example. And third, who used offensive, and this is a quote, offensive guerrilla tactics within their own territory, since they did not fare well in open battle. Now, unfortunately for the history, this approach had appeal. And the reason it had appeal is because of the use of the term way of war. It took me all of about 10 minutes to put together a list, it is the Google age, of all of the books since Russell Wiley's 1977, The American Way of War, that used the words way of war in their title. This is just the books. It's not even to get into the articles. And I had to use a little tiny font, and I had to drop a whole bunch off the bottom of the page to boot. Um, but you can, I, these are more or less organized by region. Russ Wigley more or less does it first in conjunction with Basil Hart, who has an older argument about the British. We get the British, we get British, British. Uh, uh, don't even get me started on Victor Davis. <laughs> <laughs> um, we get American Indians have a way of war. John Gray this, this is regional, not chronological. The American Army in World War I, the Russian Army. The U.S. gets lots of ways of war in recent works. I mean, this concept, this idea, is very attractive because it seems to provide a way to talk about national characteristics and styles of warfare that at least might be considered a cultural argument. And this appealed to people as a way to imagine that they were talking in, in more sophisticated ways about militaries, not talking about um, generals deciding to go left. You're talking about armies that have a way of fighting. And that seemed to, be, to people to be more sophisticated than talking about tactical choices on the battlefield. Now, the problem is that this argument takes on a life of its own and begins to assume a kind of truth, and the thesis starts to drive the evidence. Let me give you a kind of example of the, or an example of the kind of tortured logic that's needed to hold this particular version, the Celtic version, together, and for which I'm going to use Hill himself from a later book of his called Fire and Sword, which is about a Scottish clan in Northern Ireland in the 16th century. Hill stops at, some, at one point to summarize the nature of warfare, and in the, when he does, he presents a really odd mixture of arguments. By now, when he wrote this book, he learned a lot more about Irish warfare, and so he's almost, you can almost see him struggling to reconcile what he's learned with the thesis that he's already published. And so we get odd juxtapositions like this. Quote, medieval Irish warfare was based on a combination of native light infantry and light cavalry, which, by the way, already undermines what McWinney is saying about Celtic warfare. But then the arrival of Scottish axe-armed Galloglach mercenaries from Scotland led to a melding of mobile Irish guerrilla tactics and Scottish shock tactics. So the Irish Celtic form and the Scottish Celtic form are actually different, which drove out the Normans. Even after firearms, said Hill, the fundamental nature of Gaelic warfare remained the same. It continued to be based on a combination of finesse, mobility, and the primal shock of cold steel at close quarters preferably under irregular battlefield conditions. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> what is an irregular battlefield? How do you use finesse and the primal shock of cold steel at close quarters <laughs> at the same time? <clears throat> I mean, this could describe something, but it describes everything and nothing. And as for driving out the Normans, that's just completely wrong. The Normans married into Gaelic culture, and in one of the worst neologisms of all time, they Gaelicized and simultaneously became less and less responsive to the English crown's political authority. Anyway, Hill goes on. This informal nature, quote, of Gaelic warfare made it difficult for conventional armies to defeat them unless on plain ground with formal continental con tactics. I don't know what informal nature of warfare is either, by the way. Now, what Hill does rightly note is that the lack of roads in Ireland for conventional armies burdened by supplies and artillery makes it difficult for them to operate on a strategic level but then he immediately turns around and explains English defeats in Ulster as a result of Gaelic close quarter tactics. So that the, the weakness of an English army is the strategic issue, but then, and he says that, but then he turns around and says, well, they get, they're defeated by Irish Celtic tactics. So clearly I think there are problems. And so let me try to say, give you some of my critiques and then talk about what the, more or less the real Celtic ways of war might be. Now, first, one of the big problems is McWinney especially, but also Hill to a certain extent, is a lumper. 
may have heard the expression of lumpers versus splitters. In this case, he's a lumper. Scots Irish equals Irish equals Scottish equals Lowland Scottish equals antebellum southerners. <laughs> These people are all more or less the same, and they're all following the, the same uh, cultural practices, where in fact this is ridiculously untrue on a variety of levels. The other problem that Hill has is his case selection. He's cherry picking his cases. Hill looks at the late 16th century, attempts to reform Irish tactics under Hugh O'Neill. He looks at Highland Scotland, and then he looks at the Highlanders in North America in the 1750s. Now, he's not wrong that there is such a thing or was such a thing as the notorious Highland Charge, but there were a good many other ways of war, tactical and strategic, practiced by the groups that are lumping, being lumped together as Celts. And what I want to do is look at two of them. The first is that of the so-called Scots-Irish. <coughs> This is a slide of the different Ulster dialects uh, in, this, in the 16th and in the 17th century, and in some cases to the present. This is the Gaelic-speaking part of Ulster. This, this is the Anglo-Irish dialect-speaking part of Ulster. And the Scots-Irish is essentially confined, what will become the Scots-Irish is essentially confined to this area. But all of these people are going to be immigrants into the New World in the 18th century. Now, one of the original critics of McWinney and McDonald, I'll come back to this in a minute. One of McWinney's and McDonald's original critics rightly pointed out that the way they construct their argument smooths over difference in identifying American Southerners predominantly Celtic. There's little doubt about Scots Irish massive impact as immigrants to the southern backcountry in the 18th century, and they spread progressively from there to the south and west. But the Ulster Scots, this sort of larger group, but especially this group, by the, who are by far the most important source of the Scots-Irish, were actually an ethnic dog's breakfast of Londoners, Midlands Englishmen, and a majority of lowland Scots who arrived to colonize and with the task of anglicizing, ironically, Celtic people anglicizing the Irish, but let's not even get into that, anglicize Eastern Ulster in the late 16th and early 17th century. So if we want to look for the cultural background of warfare for these people, we need to look to their experience as colonizers in Ulster, or if we wish to go deeper, at the Anglo-Lowland Scots Wars of the 16th century. Now, so to save ourselves weary toil, we will in fact skip the Middle Ages. We will jump into the Anglo-Scots War of the 16th century. And it turns out that even something nominally this specific, the Anglo-Scots Wars of the 16th century, generates two different ways of war. One is that one which was fought by the Scottish state in an effort to preserve its independence from English aggression, primarily during Henry VIII's reign. And was, that was concurrent with and followed by the tradition of the border reavers, a kind of endless plunder-based system of raids conducted by border residents on both sides of the border throughout the latter part of that century. Now, the Scottish army, the Scottish state army, has been analyzed by Gervais Phillips. For, and I'm more or less following what he says for this part of the talk. The first key fact that these were wars fought primarily by lowland Scots under the direction of a lowland Scottish government informed by the tutelage of their French allies but without French resources. Now, the way they fought is they made a serious effort to keep up with continental developments in warfare at that time. They carefully copied the Swiss and German pike formations to include, in a way that would make Hill proud, their emphasis on the Swiss charge. But this emphasis derived from a specific technical and tactical weakness, not culture. The Swiss pioneered the rapid pike charge, in part because they lacked missile weapons, and they lacked cavalry. And the best substitute for lacking both of those is to come quickly to close quarters with your enemy, avoiding a lengthy time under fire and disrupting potential enemy cavalry charges. The Scots have a similar problem, especially against English armies with lots of bowmen and later firearms. And although Phillips shows that the Scots actually develop an <coughs> extensive inventory of handguns, as well as a commitment to achieving continental levels of the pike shot ratios, relatively speaking, it seems to me, they were under-equipped in that way, and they stuck with the increasingly obsolete system of charging with pikes. On the continent by that time, the pike was increasingly used to protect the gunners and was losing its sort of speedy offensive charge. Furthermore, even if you charge with a bunch of pikes, it is anything but wild and unrestrained and individualistic. The whole point of a, Celt of a pike charge is to keep formation and act in concert, not Celtic. Not individual, unrestrained, showcasing your role as a warrior. <coughs> and in fact, the Bishop of Durham describing the Battle of Flodden in 1513 says about the Scots that they advanced in good order after the German manner. 
The Scots were fighting according to the German way of war, but we need Robert Santino here to explain that to us. <laughs> now, in short, we don't even have to resort to the complexities of terrain, strategy, or logistics in here to dismantle the Celtic way of war for the lowland Scots, who would become the Ulster Scots, who would become the Scots-Irish of the backcountry south. They charged out of a tactical necessity, and they charged in a restrained and disciplined fashion, and don't even get me started about William Wallace and Mel Gibson's version thereof. <laughs> Now, the other lowland Scottish experience of war, and one that extended equally into the inhabitants of northern England, was the ongoing and nearly endless process of raiding and counter-raiding that took place along the borders, growing to a height in the 16th century and then trailing off with the inauguration of James VI and I in 1603, and then the erasure of this sort of nominal erasure of the border. Now, the reavers' tactics were essentially those of cattle rustlers. On smaller raids, they sought to avoid any sort of contact at all, relying on speed and surprise. Even the larger ones, superficially military in scope and potential, preferred to use feint and ambush in response to any local forces that rose against them. Theirs was a way of war in which the feud was embedded in politics and vice versa. But politics, especially after the mid-century, did not demand conquest-level campaigning, and the violence remained primarily on the feud level, where opportunities for the reckless charge of steel was rare indeed, however well-armed individual reavers might be. Now, it was primarily these borderers and other lowland Scots who colonized Ulster in the late 16th and 17th century. And in Ulster, they, in many ways, continued the reaver tradition, if only in defense against a naturally irritated local Gaelic-Irish population. But rather than worry over much here about a new Scots-Irish form of war created in the crucible of 17th century Ulster, about which others have theorized, most notably David Hackett Fisher, let me look at Irish warfare more generally. So now we turn to Ireland in the 16th century. Now, oddly, for his chapter on 16th century Ireland, Hill chooses to use the campaigns of Hugh O'Neill in the final war against Elizabeth's reconquest of Ireland. Now, it's odd, because O'Neill had, in fact, massively reformed a Gaelic-Irish army, and his efforts cannot be seen as a traditional form of Irish warfare. In one sense, it hardly matters, because Hill is wrong both about the traditional form of war in the 16th century and about how O'Neill's army fought. Basically, Hill argues that the Irish of the 16th century continued ancient Celtic traditions, now follow me here, continued ancient Celtic traditions of defensive strategy and offensive tactics, and won, quote, most of their battles against Elizabeth armies, Elizabeth's armies with a furious attack, sword in hand. He further specifies that even Hugh O'Neill's reformed forces used musket fire only in the initial stages of battle. In his words, quote, traditionally the Celts were not aggressors but defenders, and their military strength was based on irregular tactics and a simple defensive strategy. Now, <clears throat> it should be ironic to point out that claiming that a society that he elsewhere calls militarized was always on the strategic defensive is a problem. Now, taking on this thesis requires several steps, and acknowledging along the way that Hill is sometimes right. The problem is not that everything he says is wrong, so much as that he's cherry-picking his evidence and massaging it to fit his conclusion. Let me begin with the 16th century prior to Hugh O'Neill's reforms, looking at strategy, the troops themselves, and then the nature of Bath. Now, in strategy, if you're going to argue for a traditional culture of war, it would seem to be wise, seem to, be wise to look at the form of war most often practiced in the long term by that culture. And for the Celtic Irish, up until the middle of the 16th century, their usual form of war was with each other, not the English and was quite often centered on the practice of praying. And by that I don't mean calling on God. I mean going into villages and taking their cattle. The prime, in one sense, the Celtic South thesis talks about Celtic pastoralism. In parts of the Celtic world, that was definitely true. The primary economic unit of wealth in, in Ireland, especially in Ulster, was cattle. And when you went to war, it was called going on a prey, or taking a prey. And you went somewhere and you took their cattle, and their cattle are conveniently mobile. Uh, they will follow you if you know what you're doing, and that's what Irish soldiers were actually good at. They did know what they were doing in that respect, because that's what they did at home. Uh, and that is the way they, they built their strategy. Now, defense in this form of war, if you're trying to defend yourself against this sort of raid, the primary form of defense is to have a fortified house at the chief level. So every chief has this fortified house, which is sometimes called the tower houses of Ireland. And then to go in pursuit of whoever, whenever the prayers show up, you, you pursue them and try to take your cattle back from them, catch them. 
Now to do that, it makes sense to keep a certain number of troops always ready for both of those tasks, the task of defending the tower house and pursuing the prayer. So Irish lords had generated a social system in which troops could be permanently garrisoned on local residents who were under their control or in their clan. In essence, they supported a permanent class of heavy infantry mercenaries, which they supplemented for offensive warfare by calling on their subordinate chiefs to act as light cavalry and their peasants to fight as light infantry. Now, Hill is correct that as, Irish, as the Irish began to fight the English more regularly in the middle of the 16th century, they tended to use defensive strategies that depended on guerrilla tactics of ambush from their bogs and forests, but that's because their tower houses were entirely vulnerable to English artillery. A Gaelic lord had to stop the movement of English cannon. If the English cannon got within range of a tower house, the tower house goes down. And you do that by hitting a moving army in a vulnerable spot. It also meant that you could respond to an intrusive English fort. If the English march into your territory and plant a fort in your territory, then you can try to isolate that fort from being resupplied. And that also emphasizes partisan or petit guerre tactics, rather than using the continental term rather than the modern guerrilla term, because that's the way you can isolate a fort, and that's in fact the way it's even done on the continent at the time. Now, if the ambush of a marching column involved the occasional charge, that was because they came to battle with a force of heavy infantry mercenaries whose only function was to charge. Now, perhaps this will make more sense when I describe who these troops really are, what they look like. So there's three classes of troops we're talking about. The first are the land-poor Irish freeholders who could not afford armor and heavy weaponry. And so when they went up to war, they went as kern. And this is the term you see here. These are pictures of different forms of kern. This, this is probably the most classic a guy with a small shield, a dagger, and two javelins. This is not thrusting spear a la hoplite. These are things you throw at folks. Uh, but they also could come armed with a short bow. You can see this is not an English longbow. It's a short bow. It doesn't have the same sort of penetrating power. Uh, you can see these are Kern uh, coming away from burning the villagers' um, huts, carrying their javelins. Uh, and they were described in the sources as a kind of footman, slightly armed with a sword, a target of wood, or a bow and sheaf of arrows with barbed heads or else three darts or javelins, which they cast with a wonderful facility. By 1600, they had grown, quote, grown, grown good and ready shot with firearms, and some wealthy lords would retain some of these people as standing forces and quarter them on their peasantry, but most of them were brought as sort of a militia in response to a call for a rising out. Now, the second category of troop were the Galoglas, or the Galogla, who are the truly professional class of mercenaries. They originally arrived in Ireland from Scotland. These are Scottish mercenaries originally. By the 16th century, however, they are permanently resident as hereditary clans in Ireland who hire themselves out to the landed lords. Now, some kern might be retained on a standing basis, but generally it was these guys who served as standing forces who were quartered, living among, quartered on the peasantry. Virtually every significant lord retained some galoglock, and their distinctive attire includes the long, the long male coat, um, it's probably under this guy's tunic, oh, this is some padded armor, uh, helmet, um, and a, traditionally a six-foot galoglock axe. Um, and that was called, in English, was referred to as a spar. The axe was called a spar. And a galoglock, the galoglock were expected in an Irish battle to be the ones who decided the battle. When the galoglock came to blows, that would be where the battle was decided. And the, and the sources refer to them as choosing to, rather to die than to yield. They are quickly slain or win the field. Uh, and each soldier would come to, to battle with a servant and a boy. That's who these people are. You don't carry your own axe. You can afford to have someone else carry it for you. Uh, and together, that makes a spar. So it's like a, one guy plus his servant and a boy equals a spar. And 100 to 120 spars makes a battle, a battle of Galilee. Now lastly, wealthy Irish landowners, the chiefs themselves, fought as light horsemen. And light horsemen, in this case, has a very specific meaning means the Irish in the 16th century are still fighting without stirrups, which means they cannot charge the way a continental cavalry would or an English cavalry would. Now within that strategy, and using those troops, what do the battles look like? Now first of all, to do that I have to give you even more background. For the English, Ulster remains unknown territory into the 16th century. I like to use this map, I actually have this map in my house on the wall. It's free from the Library of Congress. <laughs> um, this is, of course, Ulster. This map turned sideways at the moment. Uh, you can see that, you might be able to see that the vast majority of Munster and 
Leinster, and even large chunks of Connacht are pretty well mapped out. There's lots of towns, there's roads. Ulster is kind of still a blank spot. This map is from 1600. And so even as late as that, the, the English don't have a good sense of what's going on topographically up in here. But they do understand a few things. They understand that there's a few streets. I'd like to turn maps north-south, so that's the way we're used to looking at them. Uh, you can, this is a different version of that same map. And you can see, if I'm the English based down here in Dublin, and I wanted to control this territory, I had to get from here to here. And this is an obstacle. This is an obstacle. We've got a couple of permanent sort of garrisons over here on this coast, and we don't know what's up here. But there's a couple of places that we have to get through to get here. Dungannon is Hugh O'Neill's uh, estate. That's where he lives. And Dublin is just down the, off the map here. If I'm going to get from here to where O'Neill is, I've got to go through the Moiré Pass. And then I've got to work my way up to the Blackwater River, which is right here. And then I've got to cross the Blackwater River. And at all of these places, there are very easy locations for an Irish army to mess with an English army on the move. Now, just to give you an example of how ignorant, in some ways, the English were of routes of movement inside this territory, in 1561, Deputy Sussex claimed on September 21st that he had Shane O'Neill, this is Hugh O'Neill's predecessor two generations previous, that he had Shane O'Neill on the run, fleeing from wood to wood without offering any skirmish. This is, he reports this back to the government in Dublin. Then, just a couple of days later, O'Neill appears in Sussex's rear and burns four villages in the English Pale. He just went right around them and he had no idea. Now, even in areas where the Irish, where the English knew their way around, the woods and the bogs remained forbidding. It was here that the Irish would ambush them. They plashed together. They would weave trees together uh, to close up passes, what they call passes. They're not mountain passes in the traditional way. We think they're passes through bogs. Um, and, the, and then the lightly equipped kern, these, these locals would run in and out of the bogs, throwing javelins or using their bows and later firearms um, and causing havoc to the English armies as they go through. And the way this looks is like this. This is a painting from 1599, it's contemporary by a participant of uh, English armies moving down the highway, as they tend to do. And the Irish, and it literally says this, from this mountains came the rebels of shot uh, down along this bog side. Along this way, the loose rebel shot um, played upon ours. So the, the rebels literally emerge out of the hills and bogs to ambush an English column moving down the road. This is the way the Irish fight. And in fact, another English army in that same year had the experience of sending a detachment to pursue the Irish back into the bog, and two of the officers become heavy laden with their armor, stuck fast in the bog, and were slain before they could be seconded or rescued. Before the campaign had even begun, this is in 1599, one Captain Thomas Reed tried to advise the Earl of Essex, who was the main English commander, that the Gaelic manner of fight will be in, by skirmishes and passes, bogs, woods, and fords, and in all places of advantage. And they hold it no dishonor to run away, for the best sconce and castle for their security is their feet. <laughs> now this image and these last two quotes are actually from the last <coughs> war, from O'Neill's War in the late 1590s and beginning of the 17th century. And this is the one that Hill primarily talks about, at least for Ireland. For that war, he says that Hugh O'Neill continued the traditional methods, using muskets only in the first stage of the battle, and then following up with charges. Hill correctly documents the way that O'Neill innovated, uh, by converting his troops to a then standard pike and shot formation. And the O'Neill's army <coughs> can sail looks like this. It's a pike and shot army that O'Neill brings to the, the, the main final battle against the English can sail in 1601. Thirty years earlier, his predecessor, Shane, had greatly expanded the social basis of recruitment, and now in the late 16th century, Hugh imposes a new, more centralized form of taxation to keep those troops in arms and in pay for longer periods of time, and during that time, he, he trains them to fight as pike and shot. Now, Hill also correctly identifies the English strategic need to penetrate into Ulster and to, to resupply forts. And he then uses the Battle of Clontibret in 1595 as his first example, which was won, as he says, by guerrilla tactics, meaning in this case, skirmishing. There's no charge here whatsoever. And Hill's description is fundamentally correct. This is a very long running fight in which an English column is constantly harried by fire, hemmed in by rough terrain, and occasionally charged by javelin throwing Irish light horse. Indeed, it was only desperate English charges with lance cavalry or pike blocks that pushed them through. 
But then Hill turns around and says on the very next page that O'Neill would regularly carry out, quote, the tactical plan combining guerrilla warfare and the traditional Celtic charge. I don't know of any other word for this but shoehorning. He's making the evidence fit the thesis he's already stated. Hill then turns to the Battle at Yellow Ford in 1598, which was a tactical encounter created by the Irish strategy of cutting off supplies to English intrusive forts. The English resupply column was repeatedly raked from cover of bogs and woods, and O'Neill chose an open field flanked by bogs and entrenched the open field piece in between the bogs to put up a blocking force. A series of running battles ensued, which Hill characterized as decided by, quote, Irish fell upon, or the charging Irish, or, quote, the hills provided the Irish with staging points for charges that rolled down with tremendous impact upon the battered enemy. In fact, as best can be determined from the English narrative accounts, this was much like Clontibert, a running fight in tough country in which the English could not deploy and where they fell victim to fire from cover over a long period of time. To be sure, the vanguard of the army, nearly wrecked by fire, was charged by Irish horse and swordsmen, which proved the last straw for the vanguard. Now, in contrast, the English charged repeatedly, both horse and pike, in efforts to right the situation. And typically, the Irish melted away from in front of them. Now, I could go on here, battle by battle, showing how the Irish decisions were dictated by the system that they had, modified by a forceful leader, Hugh O'Neill, who worked from continental models, models that he learned from the English and from the Spanish, to modify traditional Irish practices. But I'm quite certain that that would be more boring at this point than you could possibly stand. Let me sum up why I think this is important. It's not just that it means that we might misunderstand the 16th century Ireland if we rely on Hill's thesis, which people have done. The problem relates to the seductiveness of the way of war model. I think it is very easy to look at a tactical or operational style of fighting and to call that a way of war that has a cultural continuity of its own, that people fight that way for its own sake. Now, I won't say that never happens. And in fact, in my own work, I've made a similar argument. I've argued that a particular appearance of an army and its choice of methods can reflect an appeal to legitimacy by looking right. We want to look right in the eyes of others. George Washington being the primary uh, exponent of this. He wants a continental army that looks right so the rest of the world sees it. If they behave in recognizable ways, they make a claim for the legitimate role of an army. And I, I often think, when I was thinking, when I was writing this, like, how many of you have seen that, that um, Keith Ledger movie, The Knight's Tale? <coughs> it's a silly little movie, but the, the, cultural, the cultural issue is actually quite right. Here's a guy who's not a knight. He's got to pretend to be a knight, therefore he's got to look like a knight. He's got to fight like a knight. He's got to act like a knight. And if he does that, then he gets treated like a knight until someone checks his, his pedigree. Uh, similarly, if a medieval European aristocratic knight started taking up the nomad's horse bow, he would lose much of his social status that was based on his fight, he's fighting right. Now he's fighting wrong, and he's got people are going to look at him. Now, I also think that this legitimacy issue is a relatively limited exception. Now, I'm not denying the role of culture and society in determining tactical and operational styles. Far from it. What I think we need to do as military historians is examine ways of war as derivative of processes of social mobilization modified by conscious calculations of material advantage and enemy capabilities. Now, what does that mean? I'm talking about all of the complex and overlapping ways in which a society imagines what resources it will use and what people will fight. As a consequence of that imagination, acted out in a thousand, thousand little social processes, groups of men, mostly men, come together, gather equipment, and seek to win in a violent context. Who fights, and why they think they're fighting, and with what, in turn tends to generate a tactical or a strategic way of war. The tactic itself does not have cultural continuity. Now, for extended or at least predictable campaigns, the Irish socio-cultural system provided poor missile-firing troops from the tenantry. For immediate emergencies, they had hired, they felt compelled to have on hand standing forces of heavier hired professional mercenaries. Both were used in the context of wars primarily about cattle theft. The chiefs themselves fought on horseback, but they lacked the equipment developed on the continent for that form of cavalry. Given those troop types, when they faced English armies, they, they adopted guerrilla tactics. 
But the heavy troops they had were only good at charging, so they kept doing that whenever an English formation looked like it might be falling apart. And at the end of the century, O'Neill expanded the mobilization bases and equipped those new, larger standing forces to fight according to a pike and shot system, which included charging, that had been developed elsewhere. This was a conscious calculation of adopting a better way to fight, but he first had to change his entire process of social mobilization in order to adopt it. Now consider two other examples very briefly that might be more familiar. Native Americans used loosely ordered and frequently called guerrilla tactics, or in my earlier slide, the skulking way of war, because they mobilized, very, they mobilized warriors seeking revenge and prestige by taking prisoners. And their mobilization processes demanded that they avoid the heavy casualties that would destroy a small-scale society like theirs. Their so-called tactical way of war was largely determined by the nature of social mobilization, not by some preference for the tactic itself. To use a more modern example, greatly complicated by the existence of professional military staffs who are always consciously calculating, we think of modern American armies, at least until very recently, as being highly reliant on firepower. Indeed, firepower depend dependence has come to define an American way of war, at least for the 20th century. And they surely did use a lot of firepower in those wars, but that style, so-called, reflected a broad societal investment in industrial and technological processes combined with democratic forms of manpower mobilization. And yes, conscription is democratic. The culture created the force. The force fought with what it had, not to paraphrase our Secretary Rumsfeld, within calculations of advantage, models of other successes, and expectations of enemy techniques. The result has tended to be firepower heavy. We spend dollars and preserve lives, soldiers' lives. Now, this is an egregious oversimplification, but I would suggest that military historians should continue to look at the linkages between the processes of social mobilization and the resultant fighting styles. There is nothing more cultural and nothing more influential on a way of war than deciding who will do the fighting and then how to get them to do it. Yes, I'm struck by I guess not not to go in the complete other direction, saying there was a you know different you know there was a different sort of Irish war, but based on your conclusion, I'm struck by the con the uh, similarity between uh, uh, O'Neill's approach, his hit and run approach, with how the Irish slingers many centuries earlier tried to handle the Normans given their own social mobilization capabilities, where you know the, in the Norman sources the slingers would confound the Normans by kind of circling them, firing, and then when the Norman cavalry, heavy cavalry charged, they dispersed and the Normans had to develop their own sort of tactics to deal with that. And uh, was that related to similar sort of uh, social organization among the Irish uh, in that earlier period? Certainly. I mean, in one sense, the clan system is very, <coughs> there is a lot of continuity in that social mobilization process. And so, in fact, that's why you see so-called continuity. If, the, if there's continuity in the processes of social mobilization, then you're going to see continuity in the way it's expressed in military form. Uh, and frankly, you know, you have to remember, too, that the Normans win. Right. By pretty adapting. fast. By adapting. Yeah. Um, whereas the English in the 16th century struggled <coughs> quite a bit more to win mm -hmm. again. They have to win again. 500 years separated since. Oh, and if you want to look for an uh, ancient uh, analog to the Kerns, it's actually they're armed identically like Thracians. Oh, they are, except Thracians, Thracians actually would have a helmet. Uh, well, uh, 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 they would have, well the, the, well, the Thracian helmet developed later. The Thracian Peltas usually wore like a, a leather or lambskin yeah, helmet. Yeah, these guys yeah. don't even have Right, that. right, so, but, but it, not right, but it's the, the small two foot round. Well, I mean, this is, I mean, that, I'm not pointing at Kerns, so I'm not sure why I'm right. on the screen, but, um, I mean, a guy with a javelin is almost the, the, the simplest, cheapest right. form of arming a guy. Uh, you, you, you cut a circle out of wood, and you, give, you make a couple of javelins, and that's it. I mean, it's, it's even cheaper than a bow. Though it requires skill, not as much as a bow. But it does. It does. It absolutely does. But, I mean, it's the kind of skill that you have as a shepherd, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so it, it does come with the society. Um, what, I guess, could there also be the perception I'm thinking of, um, could there be a perception of a way of war and that could actually drive forces to act in a way 
that may you know that they that may not have been you know the truth at one point in time. I mean, I'm thinking like Marines. And I, I studied Marine Corps. And I bring it up. They considered you know they're considered the same thing that they're always pushing forward the very you know, individualistic that they have a way of war. Mm -hmm. But I think that also has as much to do with the fact that they believe they have a way of war. Going that's back exactly, to whether they did or not. No, that's not. exactly right. But notice one of the things I included is. And then you convince them to do it, right? right? And so there's a cultural, you know, in the words of cultural historians, there's cultural work that takes place to make a Marine a Marine, or to make a Marine think like you want him to think. And so that's part of the cultural system that, that I'm talking about. Social mobilization, when I use that term, and I'm really, frankly, still looking for a better term. Uh, social mobilization includes that cultural work of, of getting that person to become okay, yeah. who you want him to be. Brainwashing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ex army, so sure. <laughs> brainwash. The Marines are brainwashed. I'm a Marine, so I don't agree. With that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, um, concerning the Highland regiments that serve the English Empire, to my knowledge, you know, their particular thing was fire a volley and get stuck in. Now, how does that relate, you know, to you know, this, this way of war, but where did that system, if it, if it was their system, where did that originate from? The Highland Charge? Yeah. Um, well, specifically, again, with, you know, the Highland Regiments. In, with the in Highland, well, see, that's, that's the rest of Hill's book. I mean, he, okay. he argues that this is a Celtic way of war that goes back to, you know, the Roman okay. witnessed Celts. Uh, and that it's modified only slightly by being stuck into a formal military system that didn't enhance them on fire and flintlock. Um, so, I mean, his argument is this cultural continuity. But one of the interesting processes, of course, is, again, go back to the social mobilization. How do those guys get into the Highland regiments? And in fact, they're getting into Highland regiments in the 18th century because the clan system is being torn apart from the outside. And so that they're getting displaced people. They're not getting people, you're not getting clan leaders bringing their clans into the regiments. You're getting people who've been pushed off their land and recruited into Highland regiments for those reasons. And so they're not bringing with them any sort of continuity with their clan leader, you know, and this is part of Hill's thesis, that they work better in small mobile groups that can see their leader acting by example and so they can follow him and there's social pressures that are involved. Um, you know, in the 18th century, the, you know, the Highland Regiment is much more, it's recruited in basically the same way as the, as the London Regiment is in terms of the economic strata that it's pulling from, in terms of displaced people. And of course, when the Highland Regiment gets to North America, I mean, they're recruiting anybody they can find. They get Germans, they get Americans, you know, well, mostly Germans and Americans, but the occasional Scottish reinforcement might show up, but they're not pure Highland regiments. But on the other hand, it is a certain, I think there is a certain truth to the Marine Corps argument, you know, that these guys are being told that this You're is what Scots. you do. This is, okay. Right? Um, and Heather Streets has written a, a book called Martial Races, which looks at the Highland Scots in the 19th century. And by the late 19th century, I mean, the idea that they're recruited from Scotland is a joke. But nevertheless, they're being told that you're in a Scottish, you're in a Highland Scottish regiment, and this is what we do. There was a, how much of this in relation to the South, the Celtic way of war in relation to the South, how much of that is related to uh, the Irish losing this battle but never being defeated, and the lost cause of the South being defeated but never really defeated? I mean, how much of that is, you know, I'm romanticizing it, you know, wanting it to be that way. You mean James Michael Hill's work? No, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I mean, no, but I mean, is that is that the romanticization? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, James Michael Hill is the president of the League of the South, <laughs> <laughs> formerly professor at Alabama. Uh, he retired and is now the president of the League of the South. And in fact, the Celtic way of war, well, the Celtic South, um, if not the whole Celtic way of war thing, is really deeply tied up with modern identity politics. Uh, there's a couple of people who've actually done some social science research based on the way you can identify uh, people's references to Celtic heritage as often being about you know, white identity politics in the modern South. Um, it isn't always, uh, there, but there's also sort of ancestry.com based appeals to I was, you know, I'm descended from some Highlander somewhere. Um, in fact, you know, most people who claim Celtic ancestry are descended from Scots Irish. And folks have always been. Um, but there's lots of name overlaps. Like, they, they like the romantic Highlander view. So that ends up, people prefer the Highlander version of their name as opposed to the Lowland version. 
can trace it direct, you know, feel free. My wife is, my, I'm, I'm more sensitive to this issue than some. You talk about identity politics. My wife is, is, is from Montreal. She speaks French and English because she had a Francophone father and an Anglophone mother, and the Anglophone mother is direct from Scotland. And, ooh, identity politics, wow. Um, Highland Scotland. And so every time she sees an American in North Carolina wearing a kilt, she about pulls her hair out. <laughs> Speaking of identity, how much of, I guess, kind of the Scottish quote-unquote identity was constructed post-1745? Uh, because I know, like, the whole idea of tartans being connected with clans right. follows that period. Uh, much of, you know, like the whole playing of, you know, Amazing Grace, you know, in bagpipes, that I think that arrangement wasn't done until, like, 1970 uh, or so. Uh, so how much of that is kind of constructed... Uh, at post hoc, as opposed to being a, a vast quantity. Right. I mean, if you guys, if the graduate students in the room haven't read the Invention of Tradition essay, especially if the military historians on the Scottish thing by Hofbaum, the, the volumes by Hofbaum, you should definitely read it. I mean, it's the, the, the capacity for societies to invent tradition. This is like the, you know, the Marine Corps brainwashing, or the you are in a Highland regiment now. I mean, that's the invention of tradition mm -hmm. in many ways, and it has power. That's the thing; is it's not to deny the power. That's cultural work that's being done that convinces people of things and makes them do things in certain ways. That is that is real processes that are at work. That doesn't mean, just because you say it's invented, doesn't mean it doesn't have power. Uh, if people believe it, it has power. It's like Caesar's 10th Legion is no better than the rest of Caesar's 10th Legion, but they convinced themselves, uh, but they convinced themselves that they were, so they were. Yeah. Well, it's great, too, because uh, some argue that the Marine Corps has its own southern identity, and that's also Celtic, Irish, and it all ties together. It's a giant romanticized uh, version of, you know. Well, it, way of there's war. a feedback loop here. West, I mean, if you, if you spend a little time in West Virginia, right? If you spend a little time in West Virginia, you'd be amazed <laughs> by the number of families who send children into the military. I mean, it's just striking. Uh, in fact, I don't know, but I'm hoping that somebody somewhere has done the demographic work to talk about this. Um, but is that because West Virginia is poor and coal mining is on its way down, or is that because there's a southern tradition or martial mountain heritage? You know, I, hmm, these things feed together. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to deny they feed together. It's the mountain heritage. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true West Virginian. <laughs> No, May, no. But this is actually segue really nicely into the entire point of this whole lecture series, which is not so much that if anybody wants us to be debating whether or not there really is or is not a southern way of war, I hate to break it to you, we're not actually doing that. What we're looking at is the image of a southern way of war and how this gets cultivated and the romanticism and how the power behind that idea. Um, and so on Monday the 22nd, I'm going to be looking at it wrapped up with the Lost Cause and all of this, and this is going to continue on through early April. So I hope that we'll see all y'all back. If you have any more questions for Dr. Lee, please feel free to come on down. And otherwise, thank you for coming. Please pick up the literature, and we'll see you.